Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and Mark, who are off camera this evening because of the, the setting we're in, I would like to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are just blessed by the fact that the Holy Spirit, who is sent to lead us into all truth, is present within us. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord God. I, th I thank you that you sent your Son, the Word, into the world, who became flesh and dwelt among us, Lord God, to accomplish for us what we could never accomplish on our own, to reunite us, to unite us, to make us one with you. We thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, Lord God, because that's our desire, is to know the truth. So we want to abide in your Word, truly be your disciples, and know the truth, which makes us free, in Jesus' name. Well, we ended in our last uh, program, our last broadcast. We're doing, looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit as the evidence of a redeemed life, because that's true Christianity. We're looking for Christianity in our own lives, all right? And we were talking last week about patience. One of the things, I, I will mention it again because it's worthy of mention. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, it says fruit, singular. It's only one fruit. I mean, it's a, it's a link. They, they are bound together, and they are inseparable. It's like, uh, you know, you can have water, which is H2O, but you don't want the, you don't want the O without the, and have living waters. You're never going to have living water if you have one without the other, right? You're not going to have any of the Holy Spirit's fruit in your life unless you have all of the Holy Spirit's fruit in your life. And as I said, it's, it's progressive. One leads to the other. We started talking about love, and I said that's the foundation of all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that love leads to joy. And that joy leads to peace. And that peace is what leads to patience. And as we ended last in the last program, we talked about the fact about the inexorable link between patience and kindness. And I mentioned just by the way that the King James uses the word gentleness, I believe, right? Um, however, the same Greek word that's translated by the King James gentleness there is translated in the King James and New Testament the majority of times, once again, as kindness. Because they are basically synonymous. And, and what I was talking about as we came to a conclusion was the fact that if you don't have patience, you're never going to have kindness. Because you will always, if you are being impatient, you will always be upset with the people that are interfering with your plans. And you will lack being, you'll lack kindness towards them. All right? So that's what we're going to get into uh, as we start. And I just wanted to say this, because you don't want to lose your patience with anybody because you don't want to lose your kindness with anybody. Listen to this verse, okay? Because I want to, this is one of the areas where when I say the word kindness here, and I'm reading from the King James, it's the same word that's translated in the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 as gentleness. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 that I read. That verse contains the key to the best approach to understand what the Lord is communicating through through this word kindness. So we need to return to the root of the word kind. All right? It shares it shares its origin with the word kin and the word kind. All right? Now, the the key is in that verse as I said, it's together with Christ. Did you hear me say that? He hath quickened us together with Christ. He has raised us up together. Made us sit together. He has joined us, right? Why? 
Well, let me read another verse and I'll come back to this, okay? The other verse I wanted to read is from Ephesians, still in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 7, where it says, With good will render service as to the Lord, not to men, because Jesus is the firstborn of many brothers, Romans 8, 29. He's our kin, first and foremost, okay? Ever hear the expression kith and kin? Kissing cousins? Kith and kin. Nope. No. See, um, I guess I'm older than my dear brother over there. It was. It's not a common expression, but it, it, it probably was long ago. Kith and kin. Kith refers to friends. Almost like, you know, countrymen who are your, but, but not, not relatives. The kin is your relatives. And it does come from the word kind. In Genesis chapter 1, everything was commanded by God to bear after its, to bring forth new life after its own kind. Right? So, just for example, elephants are related to elephants. Pussy cats are related to pussy cats. Puppy dogs are related to puppy dogs. Horses are related because they bear after their own kind, their own kin. Because that's a family. All right? We are the family of God. We are the kin of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the entrance qualification to get into heaven. It's a family affair. Heaven is a family affair. You get there, not because of anything that you've done. The only thing that you have done is to accept the free gift of God, that free gift of salvation, achieved through the word, the work of the cross, the word and the work of the cross. So kindness is about kinship. Okay, it has to do with your relatives. But kith and kin, because kindness is going to go out to everybody. And I'll show you that, right? Kindness is treating everybody in every situation as if they were Jesus. Our big brother. Is that not true? Matthew 25. This is the words of Jesus. He said, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Right? Matthew 25, 37 through 40. What we do to each other, we are doing to Jesus Christ. We're doing as, that's why we have to do it as unto Jesus Christ. I, you may get upset with people, but if it were Jesus Christ that you were talking to, how quickly would you get upset? Well, then if you get upset, you're not doing it as unto Jesus. All right? We have a ministry of reconciliation, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.18. We're in the business of grace. Would you agree with that? That's our ministry. God has poured his amazing grace upon our lives. And we're to take what we have freely received and go out and freely give. Therefore, if we have a ministry of grace, we need to be gracious. You no, know, one of the ways I see... Or, or measure kindness. Now, you know, I'm, I'm old enough that uh, I lived in a, I grew up in a different time, perhaps. It would be reprehensible, it would be unheard of for a man to walk through a door and let it slam in the face of a woman. He would hold it. That's called grace. And yet it's common today to see that people have no regard for others. They don't care about that other person coming through the door. But that's a sign of the times. In the last days, men will be lovers of self. They don't care about that other person. So they're not exhibiting kindness towards that other person. You go out of your way to do something, an act of kindness for somebody. Well, if you saw, I mean, if, if you truly see Jesus' remark in reality of working in your life, that whatever you've done to the least of his brethren, you've done unto him, I'd be going out of my way. 
to do things, not because it earns me points, but because you do for the one you love, right? So that brings together, when you do that, that brings together that mixture of patience and kindness, right? And they have to be locked together. People let doors slam behind them because they're in too much of a hurry and don't care about the person behind them. They lack patience. Pardon me? I'm talking about like holding the door open for somebody, that act of kindness. People let the door slam in somebody else's face because they're impatient. They're too focused on what they are, are doing and don't care about that person behind them. They're lovers of self, all right? We talked about glorious interruptions last, last closing last week. And um, thanks to Mark's inspiration, we gave you the example of, of one instance where, you know, I saw that in action where we had a very important meeting and our, our schedule was interrupted by stopping for an act of kindness. And yet God did a miracle there, a, a wonderful miracle. If you missed that, go back and watch it on last, last week's program. So I had said this before, and I said this last week, patience locked together with kindness that is powered by love will lead to glorious interruptions in your life. Glorious interruptions. That's when God interrupts your plan so that he might work his plan in and through your life, right? Consider this. Jesus Christ said, when he was asked, a lawyer came to him and trying to test him, said, you know, what's the foremost commandment? And Jesus answered. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I'll get back to the kith and kin here, right? Because certainly that kindness starts with the household of God. And that's scriptural. But that doesn't mean that it stops there. In the Sermon on the Mount, we've talked about this so much, when Jesus said, love your enemy. So that kindness, that generosity, that grace, has not only to extend to your kin, but to everybody. Okay? A lawyer was listening to Jesus one time, and he was, he was listening to Jesus' teaching about the Father hiding truth from those who were wise in their own eyes. All right? So lawyers, that's what they did. These were part of the religious establishment. And they were, they, were, they were indeed wise in their own eyes and dependent on their own intelligence. To, and because of that, they were honored to put Jesus to the test. So I'm going to read, and you can turn with me if you would, to Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 29. I'm sure you all are, are familiar with this. Because that lawyer, when Jesus said, you should love your neighbor as yourself, the lawyer, it says in... 1029, wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him. And he went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, felt compassion, and came to him, and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on him. And he put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said, go, do the same. The Samaritan had the patience to interrupt his journey and the kindness to care for this unfortunate fellow that was robbed and beat. Again, if you're being impatient, you're not going to stop to do those acts of kindness because they interfere with your plans. So what's the, 
what would you say is the ultimate act of patience and kindness? The cross. Mark over there says the cross. And Alice, I'm sure, is thinking the same thing. Because it is without doubt, and to anybody who truly understands our Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the work, of, because if the Spirit is within us, it's going to attest to this. That is the ultimate, absolute act of patience and kindness. Jesus went to the garden the night that he was taken, right? And I'm sure you all know the account. The soldiers came to, to take him away, and Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the first man who was trying to take Jesus Christ. And Jesus told him to put up his sword. And then he stopped and he healed that man. You know what he said to Peter? He said, don't you know that he... I'm paraphrasing what Jesus said. He said, don't you know? I could have asked my father. He would have sent 10,000 angels. It doesn't say 10,000. It says legions. Right? And a legion was about 6,200 Roman soldiers. So... He, he was saying he could have called he could have called upon the father and the father would have sent seventy two thousand angels to deliver him. If you've read the account, angels are not are not little wimpy looking creatures in prom dresses. Angels often came as incredible mighty warriors, right? But Jesus, he said, I could have called upon my father. And he would have sent those angels. Why didn't he? Why didn't he? Well, one of the reasons, it, look, that's, it was because of his love. He went to the cross. You know, I, I've heard all these debates. People talk about, you know, Jesus when he was nailed to the cross. Well, they didn't put the nails through his hands because then they, they, that wouldn't have held him. And they say, so it must have been through the wrist. No, no, no. It wasn't nails that held Jesus to that cross. It was love that held Jesus to that cross. He went to the cross because of the love of the Father who sent him for that purpose. Isn't that what he said to Pilate? It was for this reason that he came into the world. What else does it say? Well, he said he went to the cross for the joy set before him. In the garden, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. I don't know if you heard Alice. She said, that's what Jesus prayed in the garden. Not my will, but thy will be done. So he went because of love, and he went because of joy. He went because he had a perfect peace about what was about to happen, and he knew fully what was about to happen to him. Right? Because when he came out of that supper on, the last, on that last night, he was singing hymns. He was singing psalms to the Father. He was at peace with what was about to happen. He was patiently waiting for the fulfillment of the, of the promises of God the Father. All right? You know, if I were God, I would have just done something very, very rapidly. Why? His sense of timing is not our sense of timing. Says to the Lord, a day is as a, a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. We talked about this last week. I said, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to use the wrong word. I am not anxious for the coming of the Lord, but I am eager for the coming of the Lord. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that because the Word of God encourages us, tells us that we should be praying, even so come Lord Jesus. But he was patient because there's an appointed time for him to come. A lot of people are studying the book of Revelation, or maybe probably not even studying the word, but just listening to other people and going to movies and reading novels. And The fact of the matter is, even Jesus did not know what time the return would be. But he was patient, knowing that this God's Father, his Father, had a perfect sense of timing. There's an appointed time for his return. I said one time I was praying, it was like I had a vision, and I'm just, you know, being in the presence of God in heaven, and just seeing this. There is the Father sat upon His throne, and there is Jesus next to Him. And all of a sudden, and this is going to happen one day, I mean, there are myriads and myriads standing before the throne. And the Father says, 
turns to an angel and says, get the horse, it's time. A lot of people talk about the four horses in the apocalypse. I'm looking for the fifth horse. I'm looking for the, the white horse, listening for hoofbeats beats in the sky, because he's coming. So, but it was because he had the patience that he was willing to, what is the other word for patience? That's exactly right, long suffering. He was willing to suffer through all of this to accomplish the Father's purpose. And that, that chain, that link from love to joy to peace to patience led to the ultimate act of kindness. There on that cross, beaten and battered and bruised, there was Jesus Christ. And as he hung on that cross, he looked out and prayed to the Father. He said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. That was the ultimate act of kindness. There is none other that will ever happen greater than that. This is the example. We are to be imitators of God, beloved children, as beloved children. Isn't that, that's what it says in Ephesians 5.1. You want to imitate Jesus Christ? Well, you have to operate in that fruit of the Holy Spirit that God gifts us with. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience that leads to the kindness. And it is gentleness. Because the opposite was he could have smashed everything and been done with it. But he chose not to. You know, one of the ways I know, I, I, I actually was traveling to a church to preach in California a number of years ago. And Alice and I stopped uh, at a McDonald's on the way up to the church. And when I got to the church, I had a new sermon. And the sermon was, I know the world is coming to an end because I got pickles on my hamburger and ice in my Diet Coke. Now that may sound a little silly, but it's not. Because whenever I got a hamburger there, I would always ask for no pickles. And I always got a Diet Coke back in those days, and I would ask for no ice. And it was a rare day indeed that I would ever get a hamburger without the pickles and the Diet Coke without the ice. And, and you know, it sounds like a simple thing, but why? It's, that's not difficult. You know why? Because people weren't paying attention. They were so wrapped up in their things. You know, the, the nice young girl that served me was probably thinking about a date that she had the coming evening or something. But whatever it was, her mind was on something else. And the something else would have been self. And because, because you become a lover of self, you start to care less about others. If you care entirely about yourself, you're going to care less about others. Does that make sense? Careless. 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 So people do things carelessly because they lack that fruit of the Holy Spirit. They lack that love. The fact of the matter is, we can't be like that. Because we have a purpose here. We are not here in this world to have a nice house, to have a nice car. We are here because Jesus has called us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Jesus has called us to be ambassadors for his kingdom. Ambassadors for Christ. We need to be going out and bringing the grace of God, the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God, the patience and long-suffering of God, and we need to be bringing the kindness of God into this very, very dark world that we live in. That's when people will see the evidence of God's redemptive work in your life. And you know what? I, I, I talked about this. I thank God for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I praise God for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are there for the benefit, for the blessing of the entire body. That's what Paul writes to the Corinthians. They are there for the common good. So thank God for the gifts. But Jesus didn't say, by their gifts you'll know them. As a matter of fact, in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the fact that people come boasting in their, how they operated in the gifts, and he said, depart from me, you evil ones, I never knew you. Had they come, up, you know, with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, just loving the Lord. That never would have happened, all right? So we have to get to that place where, where we are. And the reason I say that, it's what people will see in us is the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit because they can't imitate that. They can operate in the gifts or counterfeits of the gift. 
You know, magic is the imitation of power. There's a lot of a lot of magic out there. Remember Simon the magician in the Book of Acts? People thought this is the this is the great power of God. That's what they literally thought. But it was an imitation. And even if the devil had power, which he's been he's been disarmed, so I don't know if he has any power except smoke and mirrors to do magic. The fact of the matter is, the power of God is demonstrated in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, in the love. The ability to love the unlovable, the ability to love an enemy, the world is not capable of. But we are. The ability to have joy in the face of trial and tribulation, the world can't imitate that. They can, they can have all that stuff going on when things are going right, but when things go wrong, pew, the world can give you a peace, but Jesus gives us a peace that passes understanding that the world can't give, because the world's peace falls apart at the first shot. That patience is the ability to go through that suffering that we go through, those challenges. Many of the tribulations of the righteous. You know you're going to face challenges. But those are the things that give you an opportunity to have a testimony of God's work in your life that people can see and people can't deny. And you know what? It says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Because we do not love our lives even unto death. We are living in challenging times. If you don't believe me, listen to the news. If you don't believe me, read a newspaper. We are living in incredibly challenging times. They are opportune times. You know, it says that God has determined our, our times and the boundaries of our habitation. You are where you are, and you are when you are, because God has a purpose for you. Otherwise, you would have been born in a different place in a different time. Your purpose in life is to spread the love of Jesus Christ, to, pro, to proclaim the Word of God, to proclaim the love of God in everything that you do, and you do it with your actions. What's your actions? What actions proclaim the love of God? Your kindness. Your gentleness in the face of attack. Kindness is a fruit that the enemy doesn't have. Because you can't be a lover of self and have that. Your journey can never be interrupted by a stop for kindness because that has always been your spirit-led destination. That's always been your purpose. It has always been God's purpose in your life to bring that love to, to, to the, into the world that you live in. So, Father, I just pray that we would do that. We would be faithful. Lord God, by the power of your Spirit, by the encouragement of your Word, that we would be faithful to bring that kindness and all the fruit of the Holy Spirit into the world around us, that we would bring your light into the darkness of the world around us, that we would bring flavor to this tasteless world, and Father, I just ask that all in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay